Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Olivier Kreit, and I'm going to be talking to you about something very different from schedulers. I'm going to be talking to you about APIs for codecs. So who am I? Why can I talk about API for codecs? Uh, I've been at Collabora for over a decade now. Uh, first, I spent my first five years working on video calls, so on uh, largely on the Nokia phones. And a lot of this actually we had to deal with a lot of real time stuff because these devices were quite loaded and then people wanted to hear their phone calls or some reason. And they had deadlines and everything was terrible. Uh, but we also had to deal with uh, the codecs, some of which had nasty user space components. There, I started working on something called GStreamer, which is a little multimedia framework that's somewhat used in Embedded. And uh, after a while, I became the multimedia lead at Collabora. So I lead the entire team that runs things that are to do with audio and video and timing and synchronizing all these things. And a lot of the work we do is actually enabling hardware accelerated video decoding video encoding and uh, attaching that to a display and things like that. So basically making the hardware actually work. Codecs, they come in three flavors basically. The more simple one are the software, that's easy stuff, right? You just run FFmpeg and they have all the codecs in there. Software we can all do, it's very easy. Uh, then there's hardware. And hardware, it's really easy too because someone else does all the work. You just give them a little, some bytes and it gives you some bytes back. And for that, we have a pretty good API in Linux in the V4L world. But then you have a third class, which are not really full codecs in hardware. It's only some little bits of hardware that do the um, harder, more hardware friendly bits. And then you have a lot of software that actually does a lot of the um, parsing and control and algorithms and a lot of things like that. And for some reason, the, the Linux kernel people don't like that in their kernel, so it has to be in a user space library. And these are the kind of codecs I'm going to talk about. So who uses codecs? Because co codecs are difficult in a more generic system because so many different types of software use them and they have really different use cases. You can have something like a video player, or you can have an encoder or streamer, something that captures from a camera and streams over the internet. We can have transcoders that take one codec in and another codec out. You can have something like a VoIP system uh, for video calls where you, at the same time you capture, you encode, you decode, you render on the screen, and you have audio at the same time. All of these things must work. And then you have what I'll call content creation software, which is really um, anything more complicated, video editors and things like that, which are a bit less relevant on embedded, although people are, some are starting to appear. Uh, so all of these codecs, they appear in different kinds of use cases. Not everyone uses them for the same thing, and these use cases come with very, very different requirements. So from one extreme, which is broadcast production, by which we mean television production, which requires high quality, generally high bit rate, and people have high expectations, because when your video comes out on a 60 inch TV, uh, it has to look really good, because people just walked next to the TV, and then they look at it and they say, oh, I see some artifacts there, it's terrible. Uh, and then at the other extreme, there's user-generated content. People take their cell phone out and they take a 4K video and then they upload it to YouTube and uh, it's a terrible camera. YouTube will recompress it anyway. So the, the expectations are pretty low. So it's a very, very different use case, right? Because the broadcast people are ready to spend any money required to get high quality. Uh, user-generated content is completely the other way around. And then you have really at the very other extreme, what I call physical security, which really means security cameras. 
And these are all about price. So there, you can get an internet connected security camera for like 30 US dollars now. Uh, so low latency, low quality, just has to work basically. Um, then, uh, yes, so uh, for playback also, you have kind of two, s s what used to be different use cases, although they're, they're merging now, uh, you have set-top box or TV on one side and mobile on the other side. And the, the big difference was that uh, set-top box TV, it's higher bandwidth streams. So that's the, um, and then obviously my, my kind of, early favorite is video calls, where we care really about three things, latency, 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 and sometimes about the low bit rate. And uh, obviously transcoding, which can be stored transcoding, which is all about quality. I saw a talk this weekend at the VLC Dev Days of a guy from Netflix. And they say that they encode each clip hundreds of times and to just to figure out which one will give them their best quality per bit. So that basically time is not a problem. Right? They can take months to encode a clip if they can save a couple of bits of bandwidth. And then at the end you have something completely different which is live transcoding, which is what people do when you watch a TV or something like that, right? So you capture on a camera, then you send it over a network and that, that's been encoded, then you transcode it to something else and it's over a different net network. So these are kind of the kind of use cases for codecs. So they're very varied. You shouldn't think of codecs as just one thing or another. And often these codecs are kind of the same. So an API for codecs has many, many different requirements. Uh, before I go and explain what exists now and what I think we should be going towards, I'll, I'll go over all the requirements that uh, I've identified and to give us kind of a baseline of how to evaluate what exists. So these requirements fit in different categories. First, you have to be able to define, uh, uh, describe, and set the formats that are used to uh, input data into the codec and output it. Then there's the more uh, computery thing about the memory allocation, memory registration, um, to enter real-time behavior or not. Then you have to also have to handle metadata because a lot of codec people forget that uh, the picture itself is kind of useless if you don't have the metadata to describe it that goes with it. And if we do an API, it has to be maintainable in the long term and these are a bit less technical requirements. So just to go around, this is a bit of a laundry list of things that are required Then I'm going to explain why none of the current solutions actually fulfill all the requirements. So packetization, so basically when you receive encoded data, some codecs require an entire frame. Uh, this was quite common in hardware codecs because hardware people are lazy. So you have to, but you get it from the internet often in small packets, so you have to aggregate it. But some codecs also you can just send them little bits at a time and they start decoding before the whole thing has arrived. Also many codecs like H.264, for, which is one of the worst uh, examples there, have so many different formats. It's exactly the same bits, but packaged in slightly different ways to make our lives painful. And so a decoder has to tell you which of these formats it accepts. Does it accept AVC1, AVC2, AVC3, AVC4? Does it accept the byte stream format from the transport stream? There's all these different variants of the same codec, and this is just one codec. Most codecs have a lot of these um, variants. So if you're gonna feed data into a decoder or receive data from an encoder, you have to know all of these things. And this is just for the encoded side. The encoded side is relatively simple. Next, you have the raw content. That's the decoded side. So first, you have some sampling, so it means that for, uh, Video, the, the light information, the black and white information is at the higher resolution, but often the color is encoded as a, a lower resolution. You have to know what it is. Then you have to know things about the color space. So the different color numbers the, in the pixels actually have different meanings to, to the real world. And this is not always the same. And these have like complex transfer functions 
and matrices, and there's a lot of information. And this is actually very important these days with a high definition, a high dynamic range, so, um, which is all, all the fashionable thing in the TV industry this year. So this information has to be given to the codec and retrieved on the other side. Um, next, memory layout. So what, once you have, you know what's in the bits, how are these bits laid out in the memory? This is really important because otherwise it's, it's useless garbled stuff. Is it planner or packed? Which means, do you have RGB, 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 or do you have a whole pack of R's and another, or an old pack of B's? Or well, most commonly YUV, so you will have a whole buffer of Y's and then a whole buffer of U and V's, or of U and of V's. Well, there's every variance you can think of exists, basically, and they, you need to know which ones your codex will support. Um, obviously, you need to support multiple planes. On Linux, if you want to have zero copy, it means multiple DMA buff file descriptors, which was not, until recently, was, let's say, not supported by uh, uh, DRM, so you couldn't display them until not so long ago. It was a pain in the ass. Um, then you have alignment requirements, because if you have hardware accelerators, hardware bits, often they have alignment requirements. Is it like, you know, one byte, four bytes, eight bytes, 64 bytes, 25 pages? You never know with these hardware things. Then you have all kinds of other formats that I haven't talked about, tiled formats. So many codecs work hardware but bits uh, have all kinds of weird tiled formats. And it's all, not only that the pixel are layout in tiles, but these tiles can also be laid out in a weird pattern, some kind of Z pattern or something equally crazy that the hardware people invent. And then, this is not all. Then you also need to support opaque formats. So many hardwares have a format that they won't tell you what the format is. They just tell you, well, this is an image and if you give it to my other bit of hardware in the same chip, it's gonna work. Uh, and then you have to not forget about padding, right? Uh, especially for decoders, encoders, often they need a little bit of extra memory around the main one to, um, as a scratch space. So this is just describing what the actual data is. Now, to control a codec, we have to decide who allocates the memory. Um, a good codec API needs to support two types of allocation. Either it, it, either it allocates memory for you because it has some really weird requirements, or it takes memory from the outside. Um, so yeah, you can import, you can export. You often need to support both. Um, yes, generally on modern Linux, there's only really two types of memory that matter, either DME buff, which would be Ion and Android, but now it's been uh, merged and uh, regular malloc memory, which has nothing special. Basically, these are the only two that I'm kind of requiring for a, a good API. I, I would not care about the others so much. Now there is, if you're, if you're like Steven and you really care about run real time, then you cannot allocate memory, obviously, while you're processing your multimedia data. So you need to pre-allocate the memory and then somehow register it into the codec. So this is what uh, some solutions are doing. The problem is if you require that, then it's really, really hard to dynamically modify your multimedia decoding pipeline. So for example, uh, to plug in a different screen mid-video, you have to stop everything, stop the decoder, and then uh, redo your memory allocations and restart everything. This is a bit annoying just because you plug the screen and you are using a Wayland for display. So all of these things need to be taken into account. So ideally, an ideal API would do both. It will allow you to pre-register, but if there's a special event, it will allow you to do changes without breaking the streaming. And then this API, it's not also. We have, this is basically only for the video information. And then you have all of other kinds of information that you need to attach to frames and not lose. So often this information comes into the encoded stream and needs to come back out in the decoded stream. So uh, the very simple are timestamps, 
which are just seconds, milliseconds, nanoseconds or something, and time codes, so a time code is like a timestamp, but uh, it's seconds, and then you have a frame number, so it's second 34, frame 12. Um, so, uh, so sometimes you have a need to carry both. Uh, then you need to carry vertical ancillary data, bank, which is all kinds of information that was traditionally car carried in between frames on an analog signal, and because video people are crazy, they do exactly the same in a digital signal. So you have informations like uh, the active format definition, the AFD, which tells you, okay, this is a four by three frame, how should you display it on a uh, widescreen TV? Should you have black bars, should you cut the top of the button and the bottom? And this information has to be carried at every frame because it can always change. Then you have data in between frames, for example, uh, SCOTI 35 and 104, which includes things like ad insertion points on TV. There's a thing where it says, well, this is where you put the ad so that your local station can replace the national ad with its local ad, for example. So these are all critical things for uh, uh, television use cases. I'm also forgetting closed captions, which are kind of important. Uh, because in the US, for example, you cannot show TV without closed captions. And your API also tells to tell you about something completely different, that's to be about the latency. How long will it take for me as a codec to process this information? And this latency comes in different variants. There's algorithmic latency. Uh, you need to give me three frames before I get you one frame out but there's also processing latency. If you give me one frame, it will take me so many milliseconds to actually process it. And uh, some codecs, as we have, I'll show, have something called deadline modes, where you tell the codex, well, you have this much time to produce me, uh, to encode it. So do whatever you can within this time. Um, a good API should support two modes, push modes and pull modes. So push means that the producer of the data, like the source of the pipeline, the beginning of the pipeline, creates data and just pushes it down, down, down the pipeline, while pull mode is the other way around. The consumer, the, the screen or the um, um, speaker element in the, pipe, in the multimedia pipeline, at the end, pulls the data from the start, so this allows it to work in lower latency at the cost of a bit more complexity. So these were obviously all of the uh, technical requirements for the Codec API. Another really important thing that people often forget about is that a Codec API is not just a specification, it has to be a living thing. And if you just make a specification without code or with, it, it ends up badly, right? We all know that this is, this is designed by committee and it's not a good thing. So uh, for a good API, I, I would really require that it's actually an open source project, that it's a project with code that actually works, not just a specification. Uh, I want a simple C API because this is Linux, like no, no C++ or other weird things, so that uh, it's a baseline that everyone can talk and no large library dependency. So for example, something like glib, which bring you a multi-megabyte library with UTF-8 tables and whatnot. This is probably not gonna fly. So I'm going to go over the current solutions and explain a bit how they all fail at one or more of these criteria. Um, and how basically they're not the solution we're looking for. <laughs> So first is OpenMax. This is what basically this is what embedded vendors actually ship today, because of Android. So they say we have OpenMax elements, and they are how you use our codec, and they have this nasty proprietary user space library that implements you don't know what. The problem is that no one implements OpenMax. The last OpenMax certified library was I think certified in 2011 by Broadcom. No one has OpenMax. What everyone has is the very minimal subset that Android requires to work. They don't pass the OpenMax the, the open requirements, they pass the Android test suite. So if you're not Android, it's very difficult. You have to basically 
mimic the whole of Android around it, at least the whole functioning of their uh, multimedia pipeline. Also, people may not know, but the Kronos work group for Auto Max hasn't met since like 2012, I think. So basically, it's a completely dead specification. Uh, they have not even released the uh, extension for H.265, that uh, Android ships. Uh, they have it in their internal bugzilla, but no one's working on it, so no one can release them. It's, it's basically the whole thing is dead. And that has led to a lot of fragmentation. So for all of the newer, more important features, anything that they lack, well, everyone ships a slightly different API, which means that as a, as a user, you basically are using a vendor's proprietary API that looks like OpenMax and not OpenMax itself. Uh, another thing that's annoying with OpenMax is that it forces a very specific threading and allocation model. So you have to pre-allocate all of your buffers first, and then you can start processing data. And if you didn't get the right number of buffers, then you have to shut down the entire codec, lose all of the codec state, reallocate the buffer and start again, do a seek and everything. So it's, it's a very costly model for that. And uh, it's a whole framework. Well, OpenMax tried to be GStreamer by committee, and it's a whole framework that no one implements. Everyone only uses the codec APIs. Uh, there's a Tizonia project, it's open source project. They try to use the whole open Max thing, but it, it's basically not something people do. So in practice, it, it's not a good API for Codex. I'm, I'm the, it, it's really a disaster. Um, so from our, our kernel friends, there's libv4l. Um, that tried to be a transparent wrapper over the kernel API, meaning that they're stuck with the kernel-like API which is really terrible for a user space library. Um, also, it doesn't really let the kernel API work. So last time I checked, if you tried to use DMA buffer user pointer, that was still broken. You had to disable libv4l. Um, and the, let's be honest, the maintenance is not, 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 not really great. No one is really taking care of it seriously. So it's not a great API for for Codex. And the other really annoying thing there is that the, the API rules are kind of tied to the kernel APIs, so it's very long to actually add any. Well, it's a user space library. If you get it wrong, you just create a new so name and you can parallel insta and, and, and install a second one. So in the user space world, you can be much more aggressive on your APIs, make mistakes, and try again later. Um, there's VAPI. Uh, VAPI is a bit closer to what we want, except that uh, Intel has made it even more Intel specific than it was before. And it doesn't provide a lot of the useful things. So if you look at the GStreamer VAPI code, if you look at Intel Media MFX, their media SDK, it's it's a lot of code on top of it to actually use it. So it, it's, a, it's a bit of a, of a pain for that because it doesn't implement the rate control, it doesn't implement uh, B-frame B handling. A lot of it you have to implement on top. So in the end, you don't really use VAPI so much. You use a library that uses VAPI, so it's, it's not a totally complete solution. It's with more and more as time passes, they have really specialized the API to be whatever the, the Intel hardware provides. And it's only video, which might or might not be a problem. And I was gonna say, V4L has a bit of the same issue that the, the code that you have to use to make a generic V4 element is quite complicated. Like if you look at the GStreamer video for Linux uh, plugin, they're very complex. I have one of my, in, my, of my engineers has spent months and months and months working on it to make it all the models work, but it, it, it's, it's not an easy to use API. Now, there's GStreamer. Huh? I'm a GStreamer guy. So may, maybe you would think, I would say, hey, GStreamer is a solution. But uh, GStreamer, it, it's not a, a codec API. It's a, it's a pipeline model. It's a whole multimedia framework. It depends on glib. It forces a certain way of working for threading, for the pipeline formation, for allocation, 
It's very dynamic. It's totally not hard real-time capable. It's not capable of doing low latency. Um, it has relatively high per buffer overhead. So for, for low latency audio, it's completely out of the question, even for low latency video. So it has a lot of deficiencies that make it really not a good API to export codecs. And once you have a GStreamer element, it's really easy to use in a GStreamer pipeline, but if you wanted to use it in a different framework, you would be in a world of pain. It's no better than OpenMax there, except that obviously it's a developed project. There's other APIs that are uh, people used. There's the FFmpeg thing, which is kind of okay, except that it's really, really targeted towards software codecs, and which means that they don't have some of these things around how to wrap hardware elements, how to express all the requirements that the hardware bits have. So it's a bit of a pain there. And they're, they're not very focused on the hardware elements at all. And then there's MFT, which is actually quite good. It's, it's, a, it's the Microsoft Filter Transform API, I think. And it's the API that you have to implement to provide a codec on Windows. Um, and it, it's very close to what we want, actually. These Microsoft people, they, they, they might actually have worked on this quite a bit. But obviously, it's totally tied to Windows, so it's not something we can use. Luckily, there is a solution. Uh, I didn't make it. I was planning, actually, when I submitted this talk a couple of months ago, I was planning to do all of this and then come up with a solution. But then the, in the meantime, someone else did all the same work and uh, came up with a better solution. So this guy, the guy is Wim Tamens. He's the um, main ar architect of, of GStreamer. And now he's working on something called Pipewire Red Hat, which is meant to be a multimedia daemon pipeline formation system, real-time capable, et cetera, et cetera. And in the process of creating that system, he, uh, he designed a really simple plugin API that basically hit every single of my requirements. So I started by making the requirements, and then I looked at this thing, and I was like, what is it missing? And I realized, well, it's not missing any of it. So it's really the solution I wish I had designed. Um, it's very simple. It's based on the LADSPA v2, LV2 audio plugin API, which is really simple. One of the really nice things about it is that the whole API is defined in headers, so there's no heavy library or no library at all. Um, it doesn't define pipelines. If you have two SPA elements, plugins, you cannot connect them together. There, there's no plugin information. It's really only about accessing the underlying functionality the framework that you build on top of it. It can be different frameworks. You could build open, an OpenMax plugin. You can build a GStreamer plugin. You can build a real-time capable plugin on top of it. Different ways to wrap these things so the, the pipeline information is completely abstracted. Uh, it has a really nice idea of registered buffers, which is a bit like OpenMax. So you basically tell them, these are the buffers I will use. But unlike OpenMax, you can pause the video and say, this is the new list of buffers I will use. And this has the big advantage that we can change the pipeline while it's paused. While other frameworks require you to stop completely, flush everything, and then re reallocate. So this is, this is a, a big, big win. Uh, it supports both synchronous and asynchronous operation. So by synchronous, I mean I have some data to decode. I give it to the pipeline, and then immediately I, I can get out the rest because my incoming call was blocking. Asynchronous is I give it to it, and then at some point it's going to give me a, a message saying, well, it's done decoding or, or encoding. Uh, it supports externally provided threads. So one of the nice things about the SPA uh, API is that it doesn't create threads, so you know exactly which thread it's going to operate in because you gave it the thread you gave it the thread context to register into. Which means that it's, once you have that, it's easy to uh, use all of these uh, scheduling APIs to actually control. It has a separate thread for talking to the application that's not real time to a thread context that is real time so you can 
use deadline APIs there and control, you know, the decoder has exactly this amount of time because I know because I've tested it on, on my hardware and then you can do hard real-time audio, hard real-time video even. And it's not really limited to codecs. It's, it was made, I wasn't sure it would be possible, but he seems to have maybe managed to make something that just works well for codecs, but also works for other processing, uh, resampling, color space conversions, all kinds of other things. So once we have this nice API, and the whole code, I completely failed to give you the uh, URI, but it's uh, on um, GitHub slash Pipewire. And um, once you have this really, really simple API, then we can start building plugins around it and see if it works. So this was basically the core of my talk. Thank you. Any questions? Here you can throw it to Eric. What is the current status of your API? Is it uh, currently released? Is it under work? Uh, the code exists. It's going to be shipping in Fedor 27. So um, the, it's being used by Pipe, Pipe, Pipewire itself will be shipped in Fedora 27. The, the plugin code for it has been merged into GNOME Shell or as a source there. So it's, it's in like the first release stage. So it's very much the right time to try it and see if they got something wrong. So it's, it, it's not something I would say we should push on the hardware vendors like now, but I hope that in the next year we'll get to that point. One of the things I, I want to do with my team is try to see if we can easily wrap it in Open Max to try to sell it to the people doing Android too. Thank you. Could it be used without Pipewire? Yes. It has nothing to do with Pipewire except that Pipewire sits on top of it. Okay. A, so the idea is to do a, a GStreamer host, a Pipewire host, an OpenMax host, at least for a start. Maybe a libv 4 l host. Are there any folks that, are <clears throat> that have already adopted it uh, inside GStreamer or anywhere else? No. <laughs> From a driver uh, developer point of view, how will it work? Does it mean that the uh, developer will have to redo everything? For instance, uh, you mentioned the uh, VA API for Intel. So they did this because it's the way the hardware work. Does it mean they will have to redo a whole uh, decoder based on this API? Or will this API be generic enough for them to uh, do as little as possible? My, my impression is that you can, it's a bit higher level than VA, libva. So you would probably take a lot of the code from either GSTV API or LibMFX and you could put it under there. At the end of the day, it's just an API. It's not very different from, it's not very different from all the other ones. It's just all the little bits are correct. Um, because uh, some hardware only has uh, MC components and stuff, different components. So will there be a library to connect them together or uh, every, Vendor will have to redo the null parsing, the well, every splitting. So I don't have a very good answer for that. Uh, if you want null parsing and everything, there's a really good library in GStreamer that does that. So one could redo it, but my assumption is that every vendor is just slightly different from each other, that you cannot really have a generic solution. I mean, in GStreamer we tried, and in the end that's not really possible because every vendor has implemented slightly different bits of hardware. They implement it in a different way, which requires a different API to the kernel. Is it like more streaming thing? Did they stuff it in DRM? Did they stuff it in something completely different? So the, the really, I think the only layer where you can standardize is at the, uh, the I'm decoding issue 64 layer. Okay, thank you. Although there's code that could be reused, obviously.
All right. Thank you.